Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. We're so closely packed in this room, we might even warm up a little bit this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Joanne Bungie, and the uh, Planning Committee joins me in welcoming you this morning. Uh, while you are checking your cell phones, I will tell you that Channel 12, Get 12, it, it may be uh, Channel 121.8 for you, or 85, or maybe some other number, but it's the educational <laughs> television set. This week, starting yesterday, is playing uh, last week's class. So if you missed last week's class, or if you need it for a review, you can find it at 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, and 8 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, so keep that in mind. And now, live, we have <laughs> <laughs> Professor Clark Lindgren, who is a professor of neuroscience at Cornell College, doing his second class of his four-class course on neuroscience. Thank you. Actually, I probably should correct. I'm actually a professor of biology, and then I'm also like an honorary professor of neuroscience. Oh, okay. just, just, you know, um, can, is there a way to turn yeah. the lights down yes. a little bit? Uh, oh, whoops. That's better. Oh, yeah. Kind of a strange color, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Oh, that's the camera. We might have to just put up with a strange color, or else. Uh, like it's missing one of the uh, one of the leaves. Talking. And again, I wanted to remind you, um, oh, we don't have the sheets out. If you do have uh, any questions, please write those on some piece of paper and give those to me. I really appreciate getting those. Uh, and my, you want my volume down a little? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I really appreciate getting those because it, it gives me some ideas of things that you're interested in that I might be able to talk about. It also helps me to... Uh, Understand if I if I make, said something wrong, you know, if I made some if I if I gave a might have given you a misconception so that I can so I can correct that. And so one of the questions that I think I received from about six of you, so it's a fairly large question, and, and that has to do with calcium. And I scared you, I guess, by telling you this is going to kill you. And so then uh, you were looking you were looking at that bottle of pumps a little bit more suspiciously. Than that. Um, and so, uh, so I wanted to allay any any concerns you had and sort of clear that up a little bit. And and I and I really had planned to to do this, um, and I forgot last time. So, so this is the scary picture I showed you, where. Uh, Sorry, look right now. Yes, that does. You got it. It takes three Norwegians. <laughs> And a sweet, and a sweet. Oh, I see. So this, this was the the uh, culprit right here. This calcium that I'm drawing, and it's inside the cell. And so there are really two different compartments in your body of fluid. There's the fluid that's inside cells. We call it intracellular. And then there's the fluid that's outside your cells, which is called extracellular. And the fluid outside your cells, which on this picture would be uh, out here, that essentially is the same fluid that's in your blood. So the plasma of your blood is in direct contact with the fluid outside your cells. That kind of makes sense. It's bathing your cells. So the calcium that you're taught to worry about, and maybe you went to the doctor and they took a blood calcium measure and they said it's getting kind of low, you need to start drinking more milk or, or taking tums. That's actually not a, not a bad way of getting your calcium. 
what you're doing in that case is you are trying to replenish the calcium. Ah, I'm losing it. There is another pointer here, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Right there. There it is. Okay. Could you turn the volume down a bit? A little more? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Um, so, so that calcium that you're worrying about is calcium that's out here, um, not the calcium inside here. And although you might, I can certainly easily imagine why somebody might worry if they went out and binged on a bottle of Tums and uh, got their calcium up pretty high, that maybe that might influence the calcium inside their cells and they're going to die. And that, and that actually doesn't happen. So you don't really have to worry about that. And there's a couple of reasons for why those, those aren't connected. Um, one of the reasons is because really what we're talking about are two very drastically different concentrations. The concentration that's in your blood that you measure at a doctor's office is up in the uh, you know, millimolar range, which is actually fairly high. So we, biologists, chemists talk about concentrations, which is how, how you know, dilute or concentrated something is. So your coffee, if you want to make it more dilute, you put water in. To make it more dilute, if you want it more concentrated, you let it sit in the pot for a while until the water boils off and then it becomes this nice, wonderful sludge on uh, the bottom of your pot that you can drink if you want to get a lot of caffeine quickly. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's an idea of concentration. And the concentrations we're talking about out here are up in, the, up in a fairly high level, whereas the concentrations in here are really, really, really small. So, um, so part of it is that even a small change out here isn't going to have much of an effect on here, as long as you have ATP, plenty of ATP, which means your brain cells are getting enough energy so they're able to convert energy from food into ATP, which is, this, which is the energy currency. Sort of think of it as a token, like you go into an arcade and you put your money in and get tokens. You can use those tokens at the machines. The cell does kind of the same thing. It takes the energy from... from um, the sugars and fats and proteins that you eat and converts them into this form of uh, this token called ATP. And then th that can be spent in the cell to do things like actively pump the calcium out of the cell. It's happening here, it's happening here. Uh, it's also being pumped into these intracellular organelles which sequesters it and holds it away from the calcium out here. <coughs> And similarly, it pumps into the mitochondria. So there really isn't any connection between the calcium outside and the calcium inside. Another way of framing the question is that you're more likely to have uh, to run into problems because of calcium changes out here than in here anyway. Um, I mean, this is going to happen at the very end, I promise you. Or most of most of us will will succumb finally because we simply can't make enough of this ATP to keep our calcium inside our cells low. But that's really not at all related to the calcium outside. Any questions about that? Are you, are you, so do, do whatever your doctor tells you about your calcium. Don't, don't worry about this. You've heard a huge sigh of relief around the room. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, while I, so then another question that came up was, it's, it's kind of related to this one, is what do brain cells eat? And so how can I feed my brain? I think that was, that was the question. And it turns out that brain cells are, are really, really finicky eaters. Um, they will only eat one thing, and that's sugar, and specifically a form of sugar called glucose. That's really the only thing that brain cells can eat, which is really kind of peculiar. Other cells in your body can eat other things. They can eat fat, they can eat protein, they can get energy from those two different sources of food, but the brain cell has to have glucose in order to uh, to make ATP. And that's why your body does such a uh, work so hard to keep glucose levels in your blood at a, at a good level. Uh, because you're not always eating, right? Or most of us aren't always eating. So what happens when you go through a period where you haven't eaten in 12, 12 hours or maybe even 24 hours? Um, you'd imagine that the, the, the concentration of glucose in the blood might fall, might get precipitously low, which would be catastrophic for your brain because your brain has to have glucose. You can't use any other form of fuel. So what does your body do? It works It homeostatically regulates uh, and builds up the glucose in your blood. And the way it does that is it takes these other forms of energy like fat. This is why we diet, right? We reduce our caloric intake 
because then the fat cells start releasing, breaking down their fat and releasing the fat products into the blood, which the liver can then take and convert into glucose. And if it gets really severe, so people who have really severe um, you know, lost lack of caloric intake, the same thing starts happening to protein. So protein starts getting broken down, which is why people can become really uh, dangerously um, emaciated. Protein starts getting broken down, and it's for the same reason. It sounds kind of like your body's destroying itself. It is. Your body is digesting itself for one reason, and that's so it can make glucose to give the brain uh, its its necessary uh, energy. So brain cells have to have glucose, and that's why sugar, blood sugar, is an important thing, and why things like diabetes are dangerous, because if you can't regulate your blood sugar, then you really are going to run into problems, with primarily with problems with your brain down the road, which we don't want to do any more than we absolutely have to. Now, um, you might have heard about, so there's another way of thinking about feeding your brain, and that is if, if you go into a, uh, general nutrition center um, and look at their shelves that will sell you supplements for things like choline and it'll be it'll say this is a smart drug this is a smart supplement it'll make you smarter um, <laughs> and there have actually been a few studies that have suggested that if you take choline um, more choline than normal it actually will improve cognitive abilities especially people who have cognitive deficits those studies have been haven't been universally uh, repeated, and so it's still a little bit unclear whether that will have an effect. But that actually is working through an entirely different mechanism, and I wanted to show you that because it'll help solidify some of the other things I'll be talking about. So just a quick review. Um, nerve cells elicit these electrical signals, and these electrical signals are what spread through the nerve cells. So those are what uh, run really rapidly from the cell body, which has this tree of what are called dendrites. And then the signal spreads really rapidly down the axon. And you can see here it's wrapped by the myelin sheath. And then when the terminal reaches, when the axon reaches the end, it comes up against another cell. We call it a postsynaptic cell. So there's a presynaptic cell that is the end of a cell that was up here. And then there's a receiving cell down here. And the interesting thing is that the transmission of that signal from between cells primarily happens by the release of a chemical as opposed to a direct electrical uh, signal. So the electric uh, spark doesn't jump from cell to cell directly. It gets converted into the release of a chemical, which we call neurotransmitters. And you've undoubtedly heard of the word neurotransmitters because it's, it's talked about a lot. There are a lot of medications, for example, that uh, that manipulate uh, the neurotransmitters in your brain, and they use that for treating different kinds of illnesses. The most popular common one is Prozac, and the drugs like Prozac, the, what are called the SSRIs, and they, they, they manipulate the levels of a neurotransmitter called serotonin. And for somewhat reasons that are still kind of unknown, that improves the mood, stabilizes the mood of people, particularly suffering from things like depression. So, You've heard of neurotransmitters. Well, this is why, this is what they're doing. They are the chemicals that are being released across synapses. They're being shown these little green dots here. They diffuse across and then they act on the postsynaptic cell. Okay. And that process of chemical synaptic transmission is happening. Remember, I said there are about 100 billion neurons in the human brain, there are about 100 trillion of these synapses. And so the enormous complexity of the brain really comes about not only because of there's so many neurons, but also there are so many ways that those neurons can be connected. And furthermore, the thing that I study and a lot of people are interested in is one of the first places and the, and the easiest places for these circuits of nerve cells to, 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 to change or to be modified in response to experience is at these synapses. And so depending on what you're experiencing, like you're listening to a lecture and you're making associations and you're, form and you're uh, forming memories as a result of that, the primary way that is happening at the level of the, of the cells in your brain is by changes that are occurring right here. So certain synapses are getting stronger, which means that they are uh, releasing more of these chemicals in response to a stimulus. Others are becoming weaker, and the end result is a change in how these, this network of 100 million neurons responds. And that's my hand-waving, very, very superficial way of kind of describing 
the neurocentric view, at least, of how the brain works. It's these connections, and there's, uh, you've heard of the, uh, you know, the Human Genome Project. There's also now a project that started calling the Human Connectome Project, in which people really think that they will be able to figure out the map of neural circuitry in the brain, probably not initially in a human, they're doing it in simpler organisms, ultimately they'd like to do it in mice or rats, and then have the complete connectome or understand, you know, sort of think of it as an engineer having the complete electrical diagram of, of a radio or some kind of electrical device, and then be able to go in and see how that works in, in more detail. So that's kind of really the, the general goal of what much neuro, of neuroscience has been. Now how does this relate to choline? Well, this is a, looks like a kind of a complicated slide, but basically this is showing what happens at one type of synapse. Um, so there are about a hundred different neurotransmitters that are used. Each synapse has only one or, or a couple. Um, there are really only five or six really major neurotransmitters that are used. So serotonin I mentioned, dopamine is another one. You've heard of that perhaps especially because of the connection that has to Parkinson's disease. That's the neurotransmitter that's effective in Parkinson's. Uh, norepinephrine is a neurotransmitter, a couple more, but one of the most common neurotransmitters is a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And so it's synapses that use acetylcholine, they, like all synapses, they package that neurotransmitter inside these little vesicles, which is where they sit and wait for the, for the, for the signal to be released. And then when the action potential propagates down the nerve to the ending, it causes the synaptic vesicle to release the contents into the cleft or the gap between the pre and the postsynaptic cell where this neurotransmitter then binds to a receptor and causes the postsynaptic cell now to become, uh, to change its activity. Acetylcholine, um, as this diagram is showing, is made up of two parts. It's made up of acetate and choline. And what happens as the choline gets recycled by the nerve terminal and then recombined with acetate to form new acetylcholine. So the thinking goes like this, uh, if this is a synapse and you want to improve its function, put choline into your diet, okay, it will get into the bloodstream, it will get into the extracellular space, and then maybe by increasing levels of choline you can increase, you can make it easier for those particular synapses to make acetylcholine and then use them um, and, and, and use acetylcholine as the, as the messenger. That's particularly important because um, one of the general sort of functions that these synapses subserve in the brain is to uh, create our cognitive abilities. So people with Alzheimer's, other forms of dementia, the cognitive defects they have are primarily due to a reduction in the activity of these, these particular nerve cells that release acetylcholine at their end plates. And so there are some treatments that, are, that try to boost uh, the release of acetylcholine, and that does have some effects, although those have not really been very dramatic in terms of improving, not curing the disease, but specifically in trying to improve the cognitive defects in, in, in certain kinds of dementia. Um, so it makes sense that if you could maybe help out these, these, uh, these synapses by giving it a little extra choline, maybe you can boost your memory. And then even if you're just one, you know, if you're just a little, you know, young whippersnapper, you might think, well, I can, you know, even be smarter than a normal person by taking choline supplements, and so I'm going to go in and beef up on choline before I take my neurobiology exam. Uh, I don't think it'll hurt you, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, count on it to, to get you to pass the law exam or the law bar or whatever, just based on choline. But, the, but there is some, some idea for that, but that's a different kind of feeding. In that case, the choline supplements and others that you hear of, they're not being used as food for the neurons, they're actually being used specifically to uh, allow the production of neurotransmitters. George. Mark, uh, in my, I just the mind right in the last couple of days, they talked about caffeine enhancing memory. Would that be the that's, same sort of phenomenon? Uh, that's very close, and it's actually one of the things that it's on. Oh, so the question is, um, the uh, source for science news in, in Iowa, the Des Moines Register, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. reported that caffeine influences neurotransmitters. In fact, caffeine, uh, influences neurotransmitters and, and specifically influences. Well, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll, I'll come back to that. Is, is this where the problem with a concussion occurs in that synapse area? 
So the question is, is this, is this where the problem with the concussion occurs? Um, sure, but that, but it's general. I mean, basically concussions are caused by the brain usually getting, you know, rapidly deaccelerating or accelerating and then bouncing against the skull. And so it's really more just a damage to the brain cells. Uh, in fact, that's the other way the brain cells can die. So one of the ways they can die is to have calcium levels rise, and that generally comes about when the brain isn't able to make enough ATP to run those pumps. The other way brain cells can die is by physical trauma. And so really what you're doing when, when you have a concussion or any time you're banging your, uh, your brain around inside your skull, your brain is kind of a consistency of like jello. So imagine you got this little jello mold sitting in your skull. It, when, you're, when you're doing this, especially if you're hitting yourself really hard, with your head really hard, you're gonna basically be damaging, physically damaging, not just the synapses, but the nerve cells as well. And tr you know, primarily the cells that are gonna get the, most, the worst treatment are the ones on the outside that are facing the skull. Those are your cortical neurons, and those are the ones that are most critical for sort of higher level thinking. So we're really messing ourselves up when we do that. And I think if you remember my last bucket course, I'll, I'll try to get off this topic. But I talked about the, the, the danger of helmets. And you, know, you always think about helmets being a great thing that's going to save people's lives. When you put the helmet on a football player, you're actually increasing his, his, his danger. Because now the <laughs> football player or whoever is using a helmet in a sport is oblivious to the amount of uh, banging of his head that he's doing. Because he's got a helmet there that's... that's protecting the sensory receptors, the pain receptors on the scalp, which would, you know, and so you see, and I'll, okay, I'll, I'll say this and I'll shut up. You see players do this all the time, they bang their heads against each other after a great yeah. play. Yeah. Just imagine, it'd be so com comedic. Imagine they didn't have helmets on, two guys forgot, you know, they were practicing in the crowd, and they banged their heads together. What would they do? They'd fall down, they'd be writhing in pain because they would have activated these pain receptors. Well, the brain doesn't have pain receptors, it's only the outer scalp that does. So when you put a helmet on, especially the really fancy helmets they have, you don't feel that at all. It's like somebody numbed up your, your skull. And so you are doing things to your brain that nature never expected you to do. Because nature put in these pain receptors and they didn't think you'd be stupid enough to put this really nice helmet over it. And then, and then that's not necessarily stupid. But then go ahead and bang your head, you know, yeah. anyway, right? I mean, that's on there, like if you're riding a motorcycle or, or a bicycle, that's fine. You don't put it on there so you can bang heads against a fellow bicyclist. And, you know, <laughs> anyway, I'll stop. <laughs> All right, so getting back on track, so um, calcium and intracellular calcium does all these great things inside the cell. When, it, when its levels increase, it activates sperm motility for fertilization, for muscle cell contraction, and release of neurotransmitters and hormones. So it's really something that neuroscientists have been studying for a long time to try to understand how calcium does this in nerve cells. We use this, this fluorescent molecule that can report the concentration of calcium inside cells, which was a new development about the past couple of decades. And then that led to people, uh, and I wasn't the one first to do this, but I have done it, so I'll show you my video one more time. Loading this calcium indicator into the glial cells at the neuromuscular junction. And by the way, somebody, there was another question somebody asked, and that is what muscle did I do my experiments in? And these experiments were done in muscles from the lizard, and we've also, we also do uh, work on, on my muscles from, the, from mice, from a mouse. And generally, the muscles we work on, we pick the muscles because we find muscles that are really particularly thin, so they're only like a couple cells thick, and that allows us to take them out of the animal, put them in a dish over a microscope, and because they're so thin, we can image them, we can detect light very much more efficiently than if we took a big muscle, big beefy muscle from the animal. And so this picture was actually taken from a muscle in, a, in the lizard of jaw, which is one that we regularly use because it's so thin. And when we stimulate the nerve, this is what we see, is that the calcium levels rise, and these calcium levels are rising in the glial cells, not the nerve. I mean, it's also rising in the nerve cells, but the glial cells, this calcium is getting very, very large, and it's staying elevated for a really long period of time. So that was a really gee whiz moment when people first saw that. Um, and even now, I do the experiment, I still find that kind of amazing, having grown up thinking that glial cells were these nice, polite, uh, passive, sort of blue-collar cells, I use that <laughs> term, of the nervous system. 
So to, so to try to put that in perspective, I wanted to, to, to replay my analogy that I told you about. So imagine that you were studying a company, a very successful Fortune 500 company. For whatever reason, you and a team of, of, of scientists. And one of the, the ways you figured out that was really useful was you, you hacked into their computer system. And that allowed you to uh, intercept emails that were shooting between um, you know, executives in the company to you know, people on the manufacturing floor, to sales uh, people, marketing people, research and development. And so you would spend 100 years, uh, actually maybe 50 years, uh, and all your colleagues over the world have been studying this particular company and been very proud of your accomplishments because you had cracked the code, or were cracking the code. There were certain sort of things you didn't still understand, but you were starting to crack the code, and you thought you were making some progress on how this company works, why it's so successful, why, you know, how decisions are made, really who makes the decisions, how does input get together to allow the final decisions to be made. So put yourself in that frame of mind. You've been doing this for a long time, you've devoted your career to that, and then, all of a sudden, somebody figures out that the cafeteria workers, the secretaries, the janitors, daycare workers, they were actually listening to these board meetings, record, you know, noting that, taking notes, communicating amongst themselves, and then influencing the activity of these corporate executives. And the reason you missed it is because they don't have computers. The janitor doesn't have a computer, so how does the janitor send notes? How does the janitor communicate? Well, word of mouth, or, or maybe writes it on a piece of paper and hands it around. And you totally missed all of that because you were looking at emails. You were looking at electronic communications emails. So, so, so somebody comes along and says, wait a minute, I think we should be, I mean, you always were interested in the janitors and the cafeteria workers because you knew that they were essential for the function of the corporation. I mean, the time that the janitors went on strike, it was a disaster because people's mail or waste baskets didn't get emptied, and you know it was just, it was just wreck, wreak havoc on the whole company. And people were emailing out all over the place about the strike of the janitors. And so you knew that they had a function, but what was surprising is that they were actually making decisions and influencing things like you know, what product we're going to sell, where we're going to market it, how much we're going to sell it for. I mean, all these kinds of things that you just had no idea that these other people were involved in. So if you can imagine that shock, and maybe even a little bit of resistance, if you were one of those who spent a lot of time and money and effort um, on the email part of it, um, so also it's finding that things that can kind of turn topsy turvy. And no, remember that I said that glial cells outnumber neurons about ten to one. So now you've got ten times harder a problem to figure out what these these other employees are doing. They're, they outnumber these executives by quite a bit. So that's kind of where where people found themselves. That is where I found myself about um, 20 years ago when I did my first sabbatical from Grinnell and I went and worked in, um, at a lab at Iowa State with somebody called, a guy named Phil Hayden, and I'll mention him a little bit later, but he was at Iowa State at the time in, the, in their zoology department. He's since moved on and he's at Tufts University where he's chair of their neuroscience program. But he was the one who really first started telling me about this and he had done his experiments and had been showing, he was one of the pioneers who had done some of these first experiments that showed that glial cells uh, were in fact responding to what was going on around them. They were eliciting these big, big calcium signals, which if you remember the list I showed you of all the different kinds of things that calcium does, that didn't seem compatible with, um, that just seemed to be a big surprise. All right, so, um, so what, what has been learned now? So that kind of opened the floodgates. It was really that discovery um, of calcium the ability to measure calcium and then realize, realizing that, that these cells were in fact becoming active at the same time the neurons were, that really kind of opened a, 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 a lot of new discoveries that are just beginning. We're really in the nascent phases of this whole uh, understanding what these glial cells are doing. So one of the things that we know is that they modulate the conversation that's happening at synapses. So I showed you the synapse how the neurotransmitter is being released from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, Phil Hayden actually coined the term, it's now pretty regularly used, that we need to think of the synapse as being tripartite. It's not just pre and post, but there's another cell that's involved, and that's the glial cell. So in this diagram here, what we're seeing is um, this is from a review article written by Alfonso uh, 
a rock who was actually in Phil's lab when I was there at, during my first sabbatical, so I, I know him pretty well. It's been fun to watch him. He was very young, just getting started off in, in research, and he's gone on and done some amazing things in this new field of glial biology. But in this review article, he describes um, the, new, the new person on the block. So here's our presynaptic neuron, here's our postsynaptic neuron, and they meet at this, at this synaptic connection, which is enlarged down here. And this is what I showed you, the neurotransmitters being released and acting on the postsynaptic cell. But it turns out this neurotransmitter, this chemical, also can be detected by the glial cells. And, in, and when they detect it, there's, you can't quite see it, but they, they elevate, the calcium concentration goes up inside these glial cells in response to the neurotransmitter. So the glial cells have ears call them receptors, but they have the ability to detect these neurotransmitters as well. So they can, they can tell these neurotransmitters have been released. They, we know they respond to those because their calcium levels go up. And so one of the things that Alfonso and Phil Hayden and others have, have worked out over the last 10 years or so is realizing that one of the things these glial cells are doing is in response to that elevation of calcium, which you can barely see there, is they release their own message. And what are we going to call that chemical messenger that glial cells release? Well, we call chemical messengers that neurons release neurotransmitters, and so we should call these gliotransmitters. And that actually is a new term now. You won't see it in textbooks, probably, but it is basically what people talk about now is that these glial cells, they release their own message, and we call them gliotransmitters, and those then feed back to the synapse and change the way that the synapse is working, making it stronger, weaker, changing it in a variety of different ways. And that's a whole field of research right now that people are working on at various levels. And that's actually what I do, or one of the areas of my research that I do is, is studying how this tripartite synapse works uh, at the neuromuscular junction and trying to, it's just changing everything. It's really, it's been a, literally a game changer. So that's one thing, and I will, I'll, I'll leave it at that, that you can um, read about that in the Des Moines Register later on. <laughs> <laughs> but here, here's the Des Moines Register link. Okay, so another thing that was discovered, this is actually also Phil Hayden did this. Um, he was one of the people who did this a few years ago after he moved to Tufts. Is he figured out that um, the sleepiness that you feel, and also the, the, the stupidity that you that experience when you've been sleep deprived, is caused by glial cells. And so, just to be clear, I'm not talking about the sleep that's induced by the normal circadian rhythm. So you know we have these 24-hour rhythms and our hormonal levels go up and down over a 24-hour period of time. And that will make us sleepy and cause us to, to go to sleep at the same time we normally do and wake up at the, at the same time we normally do if we're in a good cycle. This is something different. This is if you purposely deprive yourself of sleep like students might do to study for an exam stay up all night, and the longer you've stayed up, the longer you've sleep deprived yourself, the stronger the urge to sleep. So you get this, you guys know what it feels like, you get this urge to sleep, that's the sleep drive. And that's different from the circadian uh, sleep drive. So this urge to sleep is something that grows progressively stronger as you sleep deprive yourselves. And interestingly, this can be studied in rats, where you sleep deprive rats, you can't ask them if they have an urge to sleep, but there's a particular pattern of their uh, EEG, their electrical pattern. You can record their electroencephalogram on their skull, and there's a particular pattern that, that's been linked to that sleep drive. And so you can, you can study this in, in rats and mice. And what Phil and others have found is that um, glial cells are, are responsible for that, and, it, it, and the way they do that is by releasing a gliotransmitter called adenosine which is um, related to ATP, so ATP is adenosine triphosphate. Uh, glial cells use ATP and then also its breakdown product, adenosine, as a, as a way to talk to other nerve cells. Um, and the way they, and so what happens is uh, glia, when they sense that the animal has been uh, sleep deprived, they increase the, the release of this gliotransmitter, adenosine, and that acts on, on, on surrounding nerve cells and induces that sleep, mm -hmm. sleep drive. Now, um, the magical ingredient in this cup, <laughs> caffeine, what do you suppose caffeine does? Mm 
I mean, it it allows you to it it allows you to resist that sleep drive. It makes you smarter. People have studied that. It actually does improve your smart your ability to do certain kinds of tests. How do you suppose it does that? What does caffeine do? Suppresses. And actually what it does is it competes with the binding of adenosine to its receptors. So caffeine blocks the effect of adenosine. So the next time you pick up your cup of coffee, and specifically if you're thinking about hoping it'll perk you up a little bit and make you a little bit smarter, um, what you're doing is you're fighting, you're fighting uh, the gliotransmitters that are being released that are causing you to feel sleepy and stupid. <laughs> Um, another uh, really interesting uh, discovery that's been made quite recently relates to the problem of spinal cord injury, which is, of course, a big area of neuroscience research because it's such a tragic um, illness or injury. And I think, Jim, you were asking, you were asking me the question the last time about um, if you cut a peripheral nerve, it will grow back. And so if you do, you know, really seriously cut your arm or leg or someplace that, and you cut a nerve, as long as, as long as you don't mess things up too bad, like really, really sort of gouge a big gap in your, in your arm, the nerves will actually regrow and they will reform their, their connections. It might not be perfect, but you can actually regain much of your function that you lost when your nerve was cut. If you do the same thing in the central nervous system, so your spinal cord, that doesn't happen for the most part. Once you cut, once you break, uh, cut nerves in the spinal cord, for the most part, they don't grow back. They, they basically stay stuck. And so that's why people who have you know, really bad spinal cord injuries become paralyzed, paraplegic, quadriplegic. And you probably know this, but um, if you look from the... Okay, if you look from the top of your spinal cord to the bottom, your spinal cord has these um, segments. They are labeled C1 through C8, which stands for cervical, thoracic, T1 through T12, and then lumbar and sacral. And those numbers, those letters and numbers, refer to the levels of your spinal cord. And at each level, two nerves come out. And, that's that, and they innervate the body roughly at that level. So your abdominal muscles are largely controlled uh, by nerves that run from T7 to T12. Your chest muscles, um, and you can see as you go up, your head and neck diaphragm, uh, your arm, hand, they're all controlled at different levels. And so that's why, depending on how high up the spinal cord injury is, will determine the extent of, this, of the ultimate damage, right? So somebody who has a, has a damage, let's say, right, what if, if their damage was right at T11, what would happen? They would lose function of like muscles in their bladder, unfortunately, and, and so they would be a, a paraplegic. If the damage was up here, right there, you're a quadriplegic. If it's way up here, like if it's way up at the top, you lose control of your diaphragm, and that's why the, the person would have to be in our head would have to be artificially uh, respired for the rest of their lives because their diaphragm can't be controlled anymore. So you get the idea, and, you, and of course, you guys, I don't need to tell you about the, how devastating that is to have some kind of spinal cord injury. But what's even more devastating is people with that, for the most part, um, know that their chances of their spinal cord repairing itself is pretty low. So why, what do you suppose is different about a peripheral nerve injury and a central nerve injury? Why might, why might one repair and one not? And you can imagine that there are a couple possibilities. One is maybe the nerves are different. Peripheral nerves just do it, and central nerves don't. That's one reasonable possibility. Another possibility, and one that there's growing evidence for, is the difference is in the glial cells. That the peripheral glial cells, which are called Schwann cells, allow the nerves to regrow. The glial cells that are found in the central nervous system, primarily these are the oligodendrocytes, they inhibit axon regrowth. And so it's actually not that the nerves don't want to or can't regrow across the damage, across the damage in the spinal cord, is that they're being inhibited from doing that by the glial cells there. And the way we know this is because some people have done experiments in, um, in, rat, in mice and rats and I was tempted to bring in a, a video in and show you, but I, they're really too upsetting to look at. I don't, I don't like looking at those videos. I figured you probably don't want to be there. You can always go Google these if you want to. But the, what the experimenters do is they go in and they crush the spinal cord of a, of a mouse yep. at some point, And then, then they can then do treatments to see if they can restore that damage. And so you see a mouse unable to use its hind legs. And then you can compare that before and after mouse to my, a mouse that has had a certain type of treatment.
And one of the treatments that is showing incredible success is to transplant peripheral nerves containing the Schwann cells into the spinal cord at that point of damage. And they do, re they start, they're recovering their function. They're, they're not 100%, but it's quite remarkable. And so it's suggesting that um, either by uh, doing something like that, which is really pretty hard to do and not very practical for, for curing humans with that problem, but by understanding what the molecules are in the glial cells that are inhibiting the axon growth, it should be possible to develop drugs that then might actually inhibit that inhibition uh, that the glial cells are, are doing in the spinal cord and allow people to recover some of their function. So um, we're, we're out of, we're gonna take a break and I'll, I'll tell you the last most exciting thing um, after the break. I can tell you that you must have taken this business about the coffee seriously because we had, we had a run on coffee and we're out of uh, caffeinated coffee. So I know you're all a lot smarter than second half this morning. And now we're back to Mark Linders. So we should relabel uh, decaffeinated coffee pots. Uh, Leah friendly. <laughs> All right, so the, the final thing I want to tell you about, uh, about glial cells uh, is that they actually make you smarter, or at least they make mice smarter. It has yet to be shown. And so this is a study that just came out this past year, and it's really taken the field by storm, I guess. So remember when I told you that um, uh, as you go up the phylogenetic tree, or basically as you go to more and more complicated organisms, one of the things that, that strikes you is that the number of glial cells relative to nerve cells increases. So that ratio gets greater as you go to more and more complicated animals, animals with higher intellectual ability. The other thing that you see is that when you get up kind of near the top, so you get up to mammals, the ratio doesn't change very much, but the cells do pretty dramatically. And so these are two pictures of uh, the most, one of the prominent glial cells in the, in the nerve, in the brain, and these are the glial cells that do, uh, are most important for mod modifying synapses, the, the astrocytes in the central nervous system. Look at this mouse astrocyte. The scale bar is exactly the same. I tried to match these up. This is an astrocyte from a human, okay? You don't really need to have any special instruments to, to tell yourself that the human astrocytes are much, much larger. They're also much more complicated. They have many more branching patterns. They extend over a greater distance. It's really, really striking. And there's a big jump when you go from uh, mice to primates and then even a further jump up to, to humans in terms of the complexity of the Did astrocytes. Did you say that Einstein had a lot of glial cells? And, and actually, yeah, as Mary Diamond showed, who dissected yeah. Einstein's brains, in certain parts of his cortex, he had more. Now, they didn't look at this, what the astrocytes looked like. But they looked at some, he had more of them relative to neurons compared to uh, 14 age and sex matched controls that they should look at. But look at this, this is pretty striking. And so what, um, what um, Macon Niedergaard at University of Rochester did with her team, and it took them about five years to develop the technology for doing this, oops, that's, that's not it, um, is they took, uh, they removed cells from human embryos. These were uh, embryos that had been aborted. They had access to, right after the abortion, they had access to the brains, and they took cells out of a particular part of the embryo human brain, um, area right here that has, um, that, that at that time, in, in like 12 weeks, I think, of gestation, has a lot of cells that are the precursor cells that, are, that will ultimately form astrocytes um, as the embryo grows up. Um, so they took those out, and then they figured out a, a mechanism for after they removed these cells, they could grow them in culture, and then they could sort them and actually find specifically those cells that were going to be the ones that grew up to form astrocytes. So there, as you can imagine, uh, at this, you know, any part of the brain, there's going to be uh, lots and lots of different cells that are going to go on and form different things, including neurons, including different types of glial cells, and so forth. So they had some different antibodies and targets that they used to sort through the cells and just find those specific cells that they knew were going to go on and form astrocytes. And then what they did is they grafted these into a mouse brain. 
an embryonic mouse, so similar stage embryonic mouse. One first thing that was technically really challenging and remarkable is that when the mouse grew up and they looked at the mouse brain, they found that the astrocytes retained their human morphology. So they didn't respond to, they didn't go, I'm in a mouse, let, you know, chill out, let's be, a, let's be a mouse astrocyte. They, they were genetically programmed to form these much more complicated astrocytes. Okay, pardon? That's sort of raised with moral issues. So we'll come back to moral issues in a minute, but yeah, let's, let's come back to that. But, but, so the question is, does that raise moral issues? Yes. But here's the, here's the surprise. They trained these mice on their intelligence and they were smarter. So here's a, here's a maze. So you can train a mouse to find out how quick they can learn a maze to get out and they use, use different reward systems. These are significantly smarter mice. Um, nothing, there had been no neurons transplanted from the humans to the mice. Uh, there were just these particular types of glial cells, and that alone was enough. Without any other, anything else being done, that alone was enough to make these mice uh, show up as smarter, not just on, on running a maze, but also other kinds of mice intelligence tests that people use uh, for that. Um, so, so the moral question, so is it because we're, we're, taking, um, we're taking human tissue, putting it in a mouse, yeah. Um, I see, I see a movie coming down the road, uh, Planet of the Mice, Mice that take over, yeah, so, so there are, uh, I don't know if they had any particular hurdles accomplishing, I think usually ethics committees, uh, you know, review boards will be more concerned about um, minimizing distress to the animals and minimizing, like in this case, these were, uh, they did go out and abort these Babies. These were part of uh, legal abortions, and they just had access to the tissue after the fact. Uh, but yeah, we're starting to cross species in a way that might be a little bit unnerving, um, and we're making them more human-like by just doing something so simple. Can you put mice in humans? So the question is, can you put mice in humans? Uh, that was done a long time ago. About the time you were born? No. <laughs> I mean, that'd be an interesting question. Could you make us dumber if you gave us? Not necessarily. That would give us different So no, that that experiment, that experiment of, of transplanting uh, mice astrocytes into humans has not been done. Probably won't be done. Um, but this has really raised some excitement. It took, I said, it took them five years to publish this because the hurdle was so high. They had to basically do so many control experiments to convince the reviewers that a you know they had really gotten these cells out of humans that they had identified the proper cells. That when they they had to put a they had to put a marker or a tag in these cells so that when they grew up to be adults they could see that those were the same cells that had come out of the humans. And that's not that hard to do, but they had actually demonstrated all of those things, and then of course showed the behavioral tests were robust. So this has been in the popular press now for the past year. I've seen it, in, in, I don't know if it's gotten into my register yet. It probably should. Uh, I've seen it in the New York Times though, and, they, and there's been a lot of interest in this. And so you might hear about that in the. In the so that's something that's been pretty exciting and opening up a lot of possibilities. Uh, I said that was the last, but last of that, I just wanted to sort of give you an idea of where the, what the future might hold for this, for this field. Um, certainly, it's leading to a re-examination of many functions that we thought we had a good handle on, that we thought were being carried out by neurons, and really um, it's making us re-examine a lot of things, like I said, how synapses work. Some particularly thorny issues that haven't really quickly uh, that seem to be really, really hard for neuroscientists to crack are things like the nature of consciousness. Um, actually, memories, we're making a lot of progress on memory, but there are certain parts of that that haven't made sense. People are re-examining that in the context of glial cells, and so there's potentially, um, you know, anytime you, look at a, anytime you look at a problem differently, you see things differently. You, you, you see largely what you expect to see, and so by having this new paradigm, I, I'm the, I'm, guessing that neuroscientists will start seeing a lot of different things that they were looking at all along we just didn't see. Um, another interesting thing is that there's been now a re-examination of many brain dysfunctions, including uh, there's been implications that um, glial cells, defective glial cells are contribute to schizophrenia, depression, Parkinson's disease, and so there's a lot of interest in, in maybe hoping that glial cells will open up some ideas that had previously been um, hidden. 
Um, and then, of course, glial-based therapy would be the next step. And I mentioned the spinal cord injury. People are doing those kinds of experiments in humans, not quite like I described it with the glial cell story, but that kind of thing will be happening. Using it to treat epilepsy, mental health. And then the last one I wanted to mention is sort of the neurodegenerative effects that are associated with uh, disease and then also aging is, is actually another really important area. And to kind of come full circle for you, I wanted to mention that there's a company now that's called Glia Cure, oh. and its goal is to take products, take, take things that have been learned about glial cells and apply those specifically to curing uh, different kinds of illnesses. And this company, I'm, I don't have any financial stake in the company, but I do know uh, its president, and uh, actually, so Phil Hayden is the guy at the top, he's the guy who taught me about glial cells at Iowa State, and he's moved on to Tufts, and now he's formed a company along with Mike Shulshevsky on the bottom. Mike is an engineer. Phil is a pioneer and, and has done a lot of the early work on glial cells. Mike is an engineer. And both he and Phil had another company that was very successful that developed microscopy techniques uh, up in Madison called Prairie Technologies. And they both sold that company after it became really hugely successful and now poured all their money into this new company called Cure. And they have a drug in phase one clinical trials um, that is uh, a treatment for, actually treatment for Alzheimer's disease. So it's not <clears throat> treating the symptoms, it really is, they have evidence in animals that it actually does reverse some of the effects of Alzheimer's disease. The drug actually goes and targets uh, uh, a beta, what the, the protein that gets secreted and is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, it actually goes in and resorbs that protein. So it's very exciting. They're in the in the in, there's like five phases of a clinical trial. They're in the first phase, which is primarily looking at safety. So they they get this drug to college students and <laughs> progressively increase the dosages and then find out that it doesn't make them weirder than they already are. Um, and then they move on to other stages. And so it's it's very money intensive. That you, the reason he's, he's even thinking of Phil, uh, namely, he's even thinking of leaving Tufts to just full time go into this company because there isn't enough money in, in the normal academic. Uh, environment, even with big research grants, there's not enough money to fund this. Taking a drug from the very beginning to the very end costs millions and millions of dollars, and so they're trying to get geared up to do that, and they're very excited about their, their latest. So, on a up, pop, up, pop, optimistic note, I'll, I'll end there uh, with my story about the journey of the brain cell. But we're not done. Okay. So just talk amongst yourselves. I have to load up. Uh, I have to load up my next talk. Any last one giant questions people have about Yeah. Yeah. Are we have any reliable information on uh, Einstein's caffeine habit? What I saw my caffeine habits? Yeah. I don't know. That'd be really interesting to look at. I wasn't being facetious about transplanting into humans, but not mice, but if you took like a jaguar, it was very, very fast, and put that into a human, would you make terrifically fast humans? The question is, could, could, you, could you turn us into, could you take some of the positive traits of, of, of certain animals, not human animals, and, and make that facilitate humans. I see a whole, I see you and I writing a whole uh, science fiction series <laughs> of, of all the kind of things we could do with that. It, it'd be probably a lot harder to do it in, re in reality, but we could write a book about it. Like sure might be able to enhance senses. Right, so that it might be enhancing senses and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom line is, sort of the take home message of that lecture is that glial cells are, it, it, we're really at the beginning, it's exciting, I tell students, this is a really cool area. If you're, if you're interested in neuroscience, go into this field because it's the very beginning. And so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, is the expression. Um, you know, there's a lot of just really basic questions out there that no one has even asked yet. So, all right. So, like, oh, is it is, is the experimentation in that area more difficult than in other neuroscience areas? Or is Not anymore. So the question is: Is, is experimentation with real cells more difficult? Uh, it was originally because people couldn't couldn't see that they were they didn't we didn't have these imaging techniques so we really didn't know if glial cells were doing anything they just looked like they were sitting there they weren't sending email messages back and forth so a little bit harder but the technologies are pretty good now um, so I don't I mean 
a little bit harder to do than to make electrical recordings, but um, not that much harder. And, and in some ways, it's, it's they're easier because uh, there's so many of them. Uh, in, some, in some ways, they're easier to culture. Uh, glial cells seem to be uh, much more self-reliant than neurons are. This goes back to another one of those other little hints. So when people first started trying to culture neurons, and so that's where you take embryonic neurons out of a rat, for example, put it in a culture dish and try to grow it outside of the animal for periods of weeks or so. People knew real early on that you couldn't do that unless you also took glial cells with the neurons. Uh, Harvey, the glial cells out of the neurons. So the glial cells seem to survive okay in culture by themselves, but the neurons don't. So in some ways, there's, some ways are easier. Is there a way, um, you were talking about caffeine, you know, to keep you awake, blah, blah, blah. Um, is there a way to help you go to sleep without being sleep deprived? I mean, or... Oh, so the question is, can you pharmacologically make yourself go to sleep? Make yourself more sleep. I mean, you can take all kinds take of... Take all kinds of drugs. drugs. I mean, so yeah, I was going to say there are drugs out there that Melatonin do that. And, and, and they Melatonin. probably do work through these mechanisms. People just didn't know it. I mean, a lot of the drugs that we take, uh, we just know that they work. We don't really know how they work. Right. And so I'm, I'm guessing some of those maybe even do work through that um, glial cell mechanism. Yeah. Would make sense that that would be a uh, way to do that. All right, I'm, I don't want to cut anybody off. I'm, I'm eager to move on to, to the next topic, which I was supposed to start about an hour ago. <laughs> so just so you know, if you're keeping track, um, this is what I've planned for my second session. So we're going to talk about this guy, Theodore Schwann. It won't take as long as the last one, I promise you. Um, I'll probably not get through it all today, but we'll finish that up next week, and then we'll start on synesthesia. Uh, so if you're kind of keeping track of where we are, um, I'll get started on that next week, I promise. I think I should have done that already. Um, you know, I've been telling you about books. Uh, and by the way, um, one of the questions that was given to me said on it, Clark Linger and Doug Fields, The Other Brain. So I think you meant to keep that. So uh, anyway, this is the book that, that a lot of what um, I've been talking about, you can read about it, uh, that's published by Doug, or written by Doug Fields called The Other Brain. For, for the stuff I'm going to talk about today, there, there isn't a good book, which is really frustrating. I really am interested in this guy, I'll, you'll find out why in a minute, Theodore Schwann. There's been no biographies written about him, there's just bits and pieces. But sort of the best book, I think, that captures his time, and actually there's a chapter devoted to him, is a book called Mueller's Lab. And uh, Johann Mueller was a famous German uh, anatomist, uh, embryologist, and had just a who's who of people from the from the 19th, middle 19th century trained with him. And so all, there's chapters for all of the different people, including Theodore Schwann in there. And it's a really pretty good book. And we have it at the college library if you didn't want to. So if you like history and you like reading about that period of history back in the uh, uh, sort of 18 mid-18th mid or mid-19th century, that, that's a book I'd recommend. But unfortunately, and I'm really, really hoping somebody will get interested in Schwann, a, histo a real historian, and will do some, some really good works. I think he's a really fascinating character, and I had to piece, piece, put pieces together that I collected from a variety of different sources and do my best. I'm not a historian, though, so I did my amateur best at trying to put together, um, putting together his biography. So, Theodore Schwann. Who was Theodore Schwann? So, Born December 10th, 1810, in Neuss, Germany, which, um, if you're not up on your geography, is on the western side of Germany. It's in an area that's called, or was called Rhinelander. Do they still call it Rhinelander today? Is that Rhineland. 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 Right, Rhineland. If you're from there, you're a Rhine Rhinelander. Okay. So he was a Rhinelander. Um, it's basically, the, uh, this is the Rhine River. And so basically this area here between sort of Belgium and Germany was where he grew up where he was born and where he grew up. Um, his father ran a successful printing house, publishing house, which means that um, he was not wealthy, but he wasn't poor. So they had some means, um, which is significant in his story. They had enough means to send their kids to school, for example. Uh, he was the fourth of 13 children uh, in a very devout Catholic family, as everybody was in Belgium, in that area. He was described by his teachers as uh, a cooperative child, diligent and modest, 
little tempted by the delights of society. I don't know what that's about. Uh, <laughs> notice lacking self-confidence and excessively shy. Uh, he withdrew into study family life and piety. So you get this idea of this kid, really, really nice kid, brilliant, turns out, extremely smart, shy, uh, a little bit lacking in, in, in confidence. Uh, he went to, first went to school at a Jesuit college in uh, Colonia in 1826, and presumably, it was never said anywhere, but presumably that was to enter the clergy. That's what people did. That's why he went to that school. Uh, while he was there, he met uh, a very famous uh, religious teacher by the name of uh, William Smets, and he strongly influenced this impressionable and brilliant young man, uh, Theodore Schwann, and introduced him to this whole idea of rationalist thought, sort of more the Descartes Leibniz view of things, as opposed to the little bit more sort of rural piety that he'd grown up with. Which was really sort of a much more simplistic view of religion and God, to a much more sophisticated view of, of sort of rationalism. And he became so enamored of that way of thinking that he left uh, theology behind and went and went and decided to study medicine instead. So he, he left uh, Colonia and moved to it started school um, at the University of Bonn in October of 1829. Uh, he enrolled in the at that time was was they had a pre-med curriculum of sorts. Um, he got his bachelor's degree in 1831, which you'll notice was in two, two years. years. <laughs> I'm not sure how normal that was. Yeah. And he met this guy named Johann Mueller on a walk in the countryside. Now, Johann Mueller was already at that time an established professor at the university. And in fact, Schwann was taking lectures from him in, in anatomy and physiology and embryology. And so he knew Mueller. And they chanced upon each other on a walk through the countryside and, um, and started up a conversation. And Schwann had ended up being really fascinated by one of Mueller's lectures in which he was describing something called Bell's Law, which was this idea that they were just getting to acquiring at the time that said that, uh, that nerves, uh, when they reach the spinal cord, when they're close to the spinal cord, they might separate their sensory and motor functions just before they enter the spinal cord. So that was kind of a new idea that, um, that had been described, and, and Mueller was talking about that. And Schwann was just fascinated by that idea. And so he said, I've been thinking of an experiment to do. I imagine this 20-year-old kid telling you this on a walk in the country. So I've got this experiment I've been wanting to try. And Mueller was so impressed by this that he said, uh, he invited me to come to him as often as I wanted to do experiments. And so undergraduate research. This is what I do. I get undergraduates involved in research. Uh, it was very exciting. He was one of the first undergraduate researchers. He worked uh, with uh, Mueller uh, for the following spring and summer, worked really, really hard, and they actually did something, did some amazing work. So he studied the frog's spinal nerves um, as an undergraduate. And just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, this is a picture, this is a, a cross-section through the spinal cord. So imagine, you know, you cut through here. And this is at one of the levels where the nerves come out. So remember there are stacks of these, uh, the spinal cord is stacked up and so that each level of the spinal cord sends out two nerves, one left, one right, and they innervate all of the parts of the body in that general area. Um, right at the, this is the spinal cord, this is the nerve, sure enough, if you look at the, what's called the dorsal side, or the side that's facing the back, right when it reaches the spinal cord, the nerve splits, and all the sensory fibers go in this side of the spinal cord. And the motor neurons, those that are going out to control the muscles, they are all in the ventral or the belly side of the, of the spinal cord. He figured that out. He did, he did experiments. He, he basically went in and, and cut, really carefully cut either the dorsal side or the motor side, and then studied the effects in the, in the in the uh, frogs that he was working on, published a paper. I still teach this stuff today. This is actually a pretty major <coughs> point that I teach in my physiology classes about uh, how this uh, separation of sensory and motor functions comes out. And this was an undergraduate research project carried out by Theodore Schwann. I just think that's amazing. Okay. Um, he took a brief hiatus from science. And, and, and what he did is shortly thereafter, he transferred to the University of Würzburg to study with this guy, uh, Johann Schontein, who was quite famous 
he was somebody who was developing new, remember he was training to be a doctor, so he, he was quite uh, interested in this Shantine, who, uh, Shantine, who was developing some new diagnostic tools, these crazy things that look like this. <laughs> so he wanted to go and figure out how a stethoscope worked and how to use a stethoscope, and that was really pretty common. That was sort of the dream that all of his fellow students wanted to go and study with this guy. So he went and spent three semesters, but no longer than that before he found his way back to Mueller's lab. But this time it was in Berlin. So in the, in the intervening time, while Schwann was studying uh, with Schuntein, he uh, <coughs> Mueller moved from Bonn, got a got a faculty position at, in Berlin at a big endowed faculty position there. And so when, when Schwann re-entered science, it was, in, it was in Berlin. Here's a picture of Schwann, and actually, um, I like this picture. I had a really hard time finding it because all the pictures like you find on Wikipedia, they show an old man, uh, which, you know, he was an old man before he died, but um, this is kind of the picture, the best picture I could find that sort of showed what he looked like at a little bit younger age, I'm guessing this is maybe about 30, uh, when he was actually doing most of his science. So he was reunited with Mueller in Berlin, and he started doing some experiments, and he actually did a thesis, and I guess back then, to get an MD, you did a thesis, which isn't true anymore, um, that's all done by PhDs, but um, at that time, he did, a, he did a nice little dissertation showing that uh, chicken eggs actually needed to have air to develop. Seems kind of obvious, but that was actually an experimental question that he addressed. He got his MD in, in 1834, passed the state medical exam, but rather than practicing medicine, which of course he could have done at that time, he was fully licensed to practice medicine, he decided instead to go work for Mueller as one of his assistants, and he got paid the exorbitant fee of, of 10 tailors a month, which is about 750 a month, which of course that was back then, but still that wasn't a lot of money. It was, he basically decided, he would live on a, a pauper's salary so that he could do research with Mueller in his lab and be one of his assistants. Um, he lived in a tiny apartment that was over a pub in, in, in Berlin. <laughs> and uh, the, the pub owner had basically converted the upper floors over his pub into ten tiny apartments, which were described more like a dormitory than an actual apartment. Um, he lived there along with a lot of Mueller's other assistants, so that kind of ended up becoming sort of the de facto dorm for uh, Mueller's assistants. These were all people with MDs and, and, and uh, working as assistants, but they were living pretty, pretty meager, uh, uh, simple lives. One of his um, apartment mates, or actually not living in the same apartment, but it turned out they all, these were such small apartments that they all lived in kind of each other's apartments. They found they could be found in each other's apartments, kind of like a dorm today in Grinnell. You know, students never sleep in their own room. Um, <laughs> they basically just sort of move around and sleep wherever they find themselves when, they, when their uh, glial cells finally tell them to go to sleep. It was kind of like that. Um, it was also, uh, they did a lot of their experiments there. It tended to be kind of an uh, auxiliary research lab where they would actually set up their little tiny apartments with their, with their research apparatus and would carry out experiments. One, so anyway, one of his dormitory mates was a guy by the name of Jacob Henley. Very famous now, he's the guy, who, if you've done any physiology, he's the one we named the loop of Henley after, which is the structure in the kidneys, and still teach that. So Jacob was one of, his, uh, was one of uh, Schwann's colleagues, and he describes him as follows. He said, I see, there be, I see him there before me, a young man of less than middle height, with a beardless face and an almost childlike, always cheerful expression plain, dark blonde hair that somehow always stood up, uh, and a fur-trimmed nightshirt. He lived in a narrow, rather dark rear room on the third floor of a less than second-rate restored building, which he often failed to leave for days at a time. Uh, he was surrounded by only a few books, but by innumerable glass bottles, flasks, test tubes, and homemade primitive apparatus. So you get the idea of, of this very passionate, very bright, somewhat, I mean, he was a geek, right? We would call him that today. Shy, not real confident, but he loved, he loved science, and so he spent literally days in his apartment never leaving doing his experiments. Um, just a quick side note, one of the major technological advances that came just before uh, Schwann started doing his work was the, what's called the achromatic microscope picture here. And that actually, for the first time, German um, and other lens makers had figured out, out how to make lenses that avoided what's called chromatic aberration. So prior to this, when you looked at a specimen, 
you'd get these little colored, like rainbow shaped things around it, and it made it hard to really make out distinct features. And so they had just figured out how to do that, and they were creating, and they had been doing that for long enough that they had made microscopes that were expensive, but were not out of the reach of, of people's ability to buy them. A microscope like this, um, and by the way, we have this really incredible antique microscope collection at Cornell College that if you've never been over to look at it, um, it was donated by a guy, Wendell Stanfleet, who was a pathologist in Iowa City and had been collecting microscopes his entire life. He has this incredible collection. It had been on display at uh, Mayo Clinic, and then he got pissed off at Mayo for not doing something right. He called me up one day and asked if Grinnell would like his collection, and we <laughs> said, sure. And it's in display over the science wow. building. Uh, it's, really, it's really amazing, and you'll see uh, microscopes like this that were about that same period of time that had, had figured out how to overcome this problem of um, chromatic aberration. So he was using that. In, in his day, this cost about 100 tailors. He was making 10 a, 10 a month. So how did he buy? He, he bought them because they didn't have research funds like we had today. So if you wanted to do research, you had to have some kind of means. Presumably his father helped. He, he had some kind of inheritance from his parents that was enough, not to make him rich, but enough to supplement his income so that he could buy a microscope like this. And that's what he had in his room. That's what he used to do his experiments. So what did he do? What did the guy do? All right, amazing, amazing career in the, in, the, in the five years shown here, which is what I'm going to talk about first. So one of the first uh, problems that he studied was the production of force by muscle. And let's see, how do I explain this? Um, so he was interested in, um, in the mechanism of how muscles contracted. And he, he built this little apparatus, and apparently, he, even, even as a child, he was kind of, he was a tinkerer, he liked to make things. He had a brother who was a goldsmith, and he used some of his tools to make some of his apparatus that, uh, that uh, Henley describes in his, in his quote. Um, but he, he took frog muscles and arranged kind of a little cute little lever system so that he could measure the force that the muscle produced when it contracted. When he stimulated the muscle with, to contract, he could generate, the, he could measure the force. And then he basically just, looked at how that force, which is shown on the horizontal axis here, so the length of the muscle corresponds to the amount of tension that the muscle can produce. And when you do that experiment, and this is something that I teach today, this is a major part of my physiology course, is I talk about this length tension curve. And when you stretch a muscle, you get more tension up to a certain point, and then it actually starts to fall off again. And that's a really, really key I can't describe how important that insight is. It was the insight that then ultimately led um, some people later on to figure out how muscle contraction actually works at the, the molecular detail. So this was a really this is a really important um, finding. But even more significantly than that, from what I've been able to gather from reading back in that time, is this was a really radical way of doing biology. Okay, in this time, people believed in a vital force. So living things, especially living animals, had some immaterial, vital force. We probably call it a spiritual force today. That was not just popular ideas or the church. That was scientists, too. In fact, Johann Mueller was a vitalist to the very end. He believed that there was this immaterial matter that, made, that gave animals life. And then when you took that away, they weren't alive anymore. Um, Schwann, going back to his early influences by Smet and Colonia, was really a committed rationalist, and he believed that you could study life, or that the difference between inanimate and animate life was a matter of organization, not fundamental qualitative differences. The difference between inanimate life and, and, and animate life was really not a qualitative difference, but was one in terms of how they were put together and how they were working. He was really committed to that idea. And so, in that context, to, to basically take a, a, a life phenomenon, muscle contraction, that was one that people really thought required some kind of living force, and then measure it using physical devices, and then mathematically describing the relationship between this function and something as physical as length, was really unusual. He was a forerunner at that time of, of thinking that way. It was really his ability to both be committed to this view of of nature and view of life as being made up of physical chemical forces, along with his incredible ingenuity ability to do experiments extremely well, that allowed him to make these, some of these early discoveries. Um, 
One of uh, Johann Mueller's students at the time, a little bit that came shortly after Schwann, was a guy by the name of Emil Dubois Raymond. If you've recognized that name, he's the guy who figured out a lot of the uh, animal electricity stuff, the experiments that show that animals use electricity. He was very influenced by Schwann, and he points out that this was the first time that someone examined an eminently vital force, literally muscle contraction, as a physical phenomenon, um, and that its laws of action could be quantitatively expressed. That's something we take for granted today, but that was really, really a radical idea in his day. Okay. So that was his first. That, that might be enough for anybody's scientific career. Uh, but he went on. He actually studied uh, digestion in the stomach. And he discovered that um, there, at the time, people thought that acid, which was produced in the stomach, was responsible for digesting protein. And he showed that it wasn't. Acid couldn't do it by itself. It required something else. Acid was necessary to change the characteristics of that something else, but it wasn't acid itself that was doing it. And then he went on to discover pepsin, which is the actual enzyme that is used to break down proteins in the stomach. So, you know, it delved into a little bit of digestive physiology. He discovered Schwann cells, um, although this wasn't anything that anybody made a big deal of at the time. It was later seen that he had discovered these cells. He noticed that there were these cells out in the peripheral nervous system that wrapped around glial cells. And remember I told you about how these cells do this little fun little wrapping thing where they come up to a nerve axon and they wrap progressively, grow around and around and around and form these myelin sheaths or these coverings. He first described that uh, and then later, in honor of him, these cells were, were known as Schwann cells and that's what, um, that's what we still think of them as. He carried out experiments um, indicating that fermentation and putrefaction were caused by live organisms. And this was 30 years before Louis Pasteur, who basically did that. He was 30 years ahead of his time. And as you'll see um, next week when we, when we talk about this, this was a really controversial, really controversial idea. Um, the chemists of his day were particularly harsh because they thought they had this whole fermentation thing figured out and it was all due to chemical processes and that it was the mixture of the fruit juices and oxygen and the nitrogen and they had it all figured out. They were completely wrong. Um, <laughs> when I say chemists, you know, they tried. <laughs> he figured it out. He did a really elegant experiment. He, he took a chunk of a cube of, of, uh, of meat, stuck it in a test tube, and then covered it so that there, it didn't have access to the air. And he showed when you did that, and you guys all know that, you, you want to uh, preserve meat, you, you seal it up really well. If you keep air from getting in, it doesn't putrefy. It basically doesn't decompose. Um, similarly, he showed that if you took air and heated it up to a really high temperature for a long time and then put that air in, it also didn't decompose. And so from that, he deduced that there must be a living organism that's responsible for that process, including fermentation. A uh, brilliant experiment, and he was right on, and he was 30 years ahead of his time. Okay. <laughs> Lastly, oops, okay. Um, the thing he's probably best known for is developing what's called the cell theory. In fact, now it might even be called the cell doctrine. And that was the idea that all life is made up of cells. And that's something that we just take for granted today. We know that is true. But in his day, that was not at all the case. Um, and part of the reason was because people couldn't see cells in animals very well, even with the really good microscopes they had. Uh, nowadays you can see cells because we have neat little dyes and, and fixatives and things that will allow us to bring out features of cells that let us see them. But in his day, you had to be a really good microscopist and a really careful observer to make out the structures of cells. By contrast, plant cells were quite easy to see in a microscope. And the reason for that is plant cells are just like animal cells. Plant <coughs> cells have a cell wall that is around outside the cell membrane. So outside the skin of the cell is this really strict, uh, thick thing called plant cells. So that gives the plant cell structure and made it easier. So the botanists of that day were much farther along in seeing these cells and they saw them in plant cells. Uh, in fact, they had even done experiments that showed that the nucleus was critical for the function of plant cells and during, during, develop, or during um, cell division, the nucleus divided and so forth. So people even had an idea that the plant cell was being directed by functions in the nucleus. But uh, animal cells was a different story for two reasons. One is they, they just couldn't see it, and two, it sort of violated this vitalistic uh -huh. idea that, that seemed to fly in the face of 
Um, you know, plants, a plant is not vital. There, you know, there's this big divide between plants and animals. Their plants are one category, animals are another. The thought that they could actually be made up at the fundamental level of the same thing was really fairly heretical. <laughs> the way he figured it out, and I'll, I'll, I'm sorry to have a, another kind of long quote, but it's, it's fairly important. He met, he had dinner with a famous botanist of his day, uh, a guy named Schleiden. And he said, one day when I was having dinner with Schleiden, that illustrious botanist indicated to me the important role that the nucleus plays in the development of plant cells. Suddenly, I remembered having seen a similar structure in cells of the Corda de Salis, and at that very instant, I grasped the extreme importance the discovery would have if I succeeded in showing that in the cells of the Corda dorsalis, the nucleus plays the same role that it plays in the development of plant cells. This fact, if solidly established through observation, would imply the negation of a vital force common to animals and would make it necessary to admit the individual life of the elementary parts of other tissues and a common means of formation through cells. This recognition of a principle later verified by observation constitutes the discovery I had the good fortune to make. And actually after dinner he took Schleiden with him to the laboratory and showed him his, his, his uh, corda de sal cells and Schleiden agreed, yeah, those look like nuclei. And from that he really established the cell theory which um, really shattered people's ideas about animals and animal life, really shot a big hole in the whole vitalist theory because if you're maintaining that animals have this special vital force, then you have to argue that plants do as well, if they're basically working by the same level. People didn't want to go that far. So it really sort of set, up, set him up, uh, was fairly controversial, but extremely, extremely important for, um, for the future of science. And, I'm gonna end, I have a cliffhanger to end on. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to go two minutes over, just real quickly. Okay, so here's the cliffhanger that I want you to think about before, before next week. How did Theodore live out the remaining 43 years of his life? He was 30, um, so he had a long life. He didn't know it at the time, but we know now. He had a long, great life, um, supposedly. Um, first of all, did he take a position at a prestigious university and establish a long and productive scientific career? He had done some amazing things. People recognized his genius. Was that what he did? Did he start a rock band and tour the new world? Oh. She would have been a Stratagascar, too. Um, or did he remove himself from the intellectual center of Europe and stop contributing to science? Tune in next time. Coffee and chocolate cake, and come back even smarter next week. We'll see you then. <laughs>